Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino, and today I have with me a very special guest, another person out of our Street Cop Survivors Club slash group, a police officer who's sustained a significant injury in the line of duty, and we're appreciative of the fact that you are here today to tell your side of the story and maybe offer some more advice to other police officers who are still out there in the field doing this job the takeaways, the good, the bad. But without further ado, Donovan Hevener. How are you doing, Donovan? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Why don't you give us the one-minute bio of who you are, where you're from, how long you've been on the job? All right. Well, uh, born and raised in Wisconsin. Uh, started as a sheriff's deputy there. Uh, got tired of the snow and the winter. Uh, found a department out in Washington State, um, just south of Seattle, called Hold Federal on a Police second. Department. Let me, let, me, let me back this up a second. I thought you were going to say Florida. You went from <laughs> fucking Wisconsin to Washington. You made it sound like, here he goes. It was Texas. He was in Arizona. <laughs> you realize you did not really solve the problem, correct? I, I know. I know. It's okay. Weather's a little bit better. You should um, probably change it that, like, I was sick of cheese curds, and I wanted no. to protest the police, so I went to Washington. No, but I can't, I can't say I'm sick of cheese curds because if anyone comes out to visit, that's their price of admission to stay at my house is cheese curds. So I'm going to, uh, truth be told, I went to Wisconsin for the first time about two years ago in Osseo. Bill Prudlick, who's the chief out there, hosted us. Great guy. Um, I decided that I was going to try cheese curds. I was convinced by a waitress at this restaurant that had rave reviews. And I have to warn people that if you're not from Wisconsin and you haven't had cheese curds before, you think it's like a mozzarella stick, but it's not. Um, and I got to tell you, I was bound up pretty good for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. I was, yeah, I was doing it right. Everything I could to try to release that damn. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I know it all too well. <laughs> okay. So anyway, carry on your story. You're back. You're in. You've transferred to Washington D.C. Yeah, I helped start up the uh, Federal Police Department out here, which started in 1996. I said Washington D.C. Let me let me go back in Washington. Oh. Yeah, sorry, apologies. Yeah. Washington State, yes, yeah. So, uh, and I stayed out uh, in in Federal Way um, area until 2002. Family drove me back to uh, Wisconsin to be with family again, and I worked at two smaller departments. And when I say smaller departments, two departments were about 12 officers apiece, um, and did a supervisory gig for a while there. And then I always knew I wanted to come back to Federal Way. I never wanted to leave. Uh, promised the chief I was going to be back. Kids were out of the house, out of college, and me and the wife decided it's time to come back. So I moved back here in 2016 and, and have been working with the department since. I've been a motor officer, um, a detective. Uh, currently, I'm the recruiting and uh, background investigator for uh, the police department. So, How big is the agency? Uh, we have 150 sworn. Oh, wow. Big. Uh, city's about 100,000. We just uh, tipped the 100,000 mark. So uh, wow. we're, we're a decent sized agency. And on the map, where are you guys in relation to what other people would know about Washington State? Uh, we are about 40 minutes south of Seattle. We actually border the north side of Tacoma. Okay, so does that, I'm sure it's not everybody's mind listening to this, does that madness spill down into your area? Uh, it does a little bit, yes, it does. Okay. Gotcha. It's got to be a tough state to work, to be quite honest with you. It, it is. And, and thankfully, through all these reforms and everything, I've been doing the recruiting and hiring, so I haven't had to deal with it on the road. But uh, to all the guys at my department that that deal with it, um, my hat's off to them. Uh, the men and women at my department are doing a fantastic job navigating those new reforms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just um, there is something very odd about the two states that sit in the top left corner, I'm not counting Alaska. Of the United States, I have no idea. What do you think? And before we go into your story, where do you think a lot of that stems from? Why is there such anti-police rhetoric and and such liberalism so prevalent in that area? I have no idea. It just seems like everyone's just kind of come to this area as the uh, as the founders of liberals. I guess I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of socialist uh, beliefs here, and and liberals, and us, you know, those that are conservatives just make our way through it because we love. We love the state. I mean, it's a beautiful state to live in, and that's what keeps me here. You know, Wisconsin, people may not know, is actually a very conservative state. It's, where, oddly enough, right next door, you have Minnesota, which is a non-conservative state, very liberal state. So yeah. it's very interesting. You know, I guess the same could be said for anywhere in the United States. You 
you know, it's weird. People think Jersey's a liberal place, but it's not. A lot of the liberal idealisms are just stemming out of our more inner city areas. But overall, it's a very conservative, extremely police friendly state. For one that's thought of as as, as liberal, the cops are loved here. Donovan. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are. Do they call you Don or Donovan? Donovan. Okay. Yeah. So they 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 are being a cop here is like it really you're held at a high regard. Maybe there's a couple agencies that they don't feel like that way, but yeah, no, being a cop here is a it's a good place to be a police officer as far as the public support. People love the cops in Jersey. Yeah, and, and I have to say in Washington, um, things are starting to change again. Uh, you know, the first round of reforms took uh, the reasonable suspicion stops away from us. And now this last session, they gave it back to us because they understood that that's just a basic form of policing and that's how we're going to, you know, keep crime down. So we're still trying to get pursuits back. You're crazy. We just got pursuits (laughs) back here in Jersey. And look, man, that's why I didn't say anything bad about the people who are the powers to be. Um, I'm glad that they woke up. I, our governor is not an anti-police governor. He's just, I just know he's not. I know people that are close to him. Like he does not not like the police, uh, and I'm not going to elaborate on that any further. But you know, uh, just an article the other day came out in the New York Post. NYPD was defunded by Mil- Bill De Blasio by a billion dollars. Instead of five billion dollar budget, it was down to a four billion dollar budget. The crazy thing is, this year so far, as of May one, they were at 149 million dollars in overtime. So clearly, because they can't, and they don't even have enough people, they lost like, dude, they lost thousands of cops, mm-hmm. thousands left, rightfully so. And we are showing now, clear as day, even people who were anti police are submitting that this was a really bad idea. Yep. Yep. Fortunately and for so, me, my, my city actually added 13 officers last October. Right. So they took a different stance, even in Washington. Uh, they knew that we needed it. So are you guys getting people trickling down out of like Seattle and those fucked up areas? Yep. Yep. I've gotten some uh, from Seattle. Uh, the county that we're in, King County, is, uh, you know, one of the bigger counties. And I've gotten a couple officers from there. So we are seeing the, the effects of them moving out of those those uh, departments that just don't have that support. And our department actually has a lot of support from the community and our city council. That's wonderful, man. It's great to hear that. And it's actually refreshing for our listeners to know that it's not just where you are. Um, There's a lot of places where the law enforcement community is still very much supported and very much admired and, you know, continue to train and grow and be and evolve as human beings. And we'll gain back and continue to gain more and more believers in in, in who we are, what we do. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm confident that's going to happen. You're in the Survivors Club, right? On Facebook. I am. Yes. Yeah. How's that been for you? Um, it's been heaven sent. I mean, right. uh, I know they've done some meetings uh, where they get together. I haven't been able to make any of them, but just reading the stories and reading the support um, that everyone has, it's it's just fantastic. And and I got to say, and uh, I've been listening to the episodes. Um, my wife has found so much comfort in the Family Survivors Club that you guys have as well. That's great. Um, there's only like 23 members in it, but. Uh, she doesn't miss a call now. Um, she's become very close friends, uh, you know, cross country, but close friends with some of the the wives uh, and spouses that are in that club um, as well. So she finds a lot of comfort in that as well. Great, man. Like it actually gives me chills for you to say that. Um, I wasn't fishing for a compliment. I kind of was saying it so everybody knows that it exists. If this is the first episode of this podcast you're hearing. Did you know about us before that Survivors Club or you had no idea? I had no idea about it. Uh, there was a friend back in Wisconsin who had some contacts. And uh, I think it was probably three days after my incident, um, his message popped up in my uh, Facebook Messenger and uh, was inviting me to the group. So awesome, man. Have you joined the other group too, the actual the, the big boy? I have. Yes, I have joined Excellent. that as well. Man, yeah. I, you know, listen, we're trying to. It's interesting how the company, even though with technology, has crept across the country. And now we're officially on the West Coast hosting classes in California. Um, and, and, I think you'll see more and more coming out. So people ask me, will you go to Washington? Will you go to Seattle? Will you go to Portland? Will you go to, yeah, yeah. There are cops there, right? Yeah. yeah we're going, we're coming. Like, you know, I'm not going to sit there and, you know, cheer on the things that have been handed to these poor folks. I will not pander, but if there are cops who need to be trained and need our help, we're coming. I might we'll know someone who could uh, bring you out this way too. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I see what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So bring us back to the incident that occurred. I've read a little bit about it. Um, 
I'm sure you'll be better at telling it and I'll be listening here and we're eager to hear from you. All right. Well, it was uh, actually Halloween uh, last year. Uh, got up to do my normal morning run. Uh, at the time, I was uh, running uh, a bunch. And with COVID and everything, I was doing some virtual runs. I had a 10K virtual run I was going to do. Um, more normal routine in the morning, got up, got ready. Uh, for some reason that morning, I looked at my gun safe. I'm like, ah, I don't even want to deal with that today. Um, so I didn't. I decided not to bring my gun with me. Uh, grabbed the dog, uh, tried getting him to come off the bed. He normally would get up ready, ready to run with me. He didn't want to run with me at all. Uh, so I was like, all right, I guess I'm going out solo. And I hit the road and about Bro, five and a half. As you're talking about this, I remember this story now. Yeah. So I was about five miles into my run um, and hadn't pl planned to run in the area that I was in. I just needed to find some more distance uh, in my route. And I was just running down the road. And all of a sudden, I look off to my left and I see two guys uh, in, with two pickup trucks in a parking lot of a business and wrapping straps around the door and onto the, the bumper of the car. And I was wow. like, it's going down. Uh, so what I did is, I mean, I, the good off-duty police officer, I tried to find a place I thought was good to hide at. I mean, it wasn't a really great area, um, but started calling 911 because I wanted the, the, you know, the local uh, PD to start heading that way. So I started making the call and for some reason, all of a sudden they both just looked right at my direction, pulled the straps off the door, hopped in the truck and they peeled out of the parking lot. And at that point, when they left the lot, that's where I have really lost that portion of my memory. Um, I'm told one of them pulled out of the lot, drove right by me and shot me. Wow. Um, I just remember hearing two gunshots and thinking, did they just shoot me with a paintball gun? Cause my stomach hurt and I felt my stomach. I didn't see anything in my hand. And I, I just said to myself, I, I think I was shot. Um, wow. <laughs> it was, it was crazy. And I looked across the street and I see a guy standing over there uh, who I think to this day, and I haven't been able to get the investigators to, figure it out or not. I think he was the lookout. Um, and he just wow. started walking. Yeah. He started walking towards me and I, I knew I needed to get out in the traffic. It was seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. So there wasn't a lot of people out there. So wow. I just turned. And, and the funny thing is when I tell the story, I just turned and I started running towards the lights and I know you're not supposed to do that after you've been shot, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I kept running down the road. Uh, I clocked it after, and it was about 150 yards. I ran before someone actually stopped. And I just kind of uh, that was it for me. I collapsed on the side of the road and, and thankfully the, the local police department and the fire department were pulling up right then. Wow. So they were already in route because you already called 911. Yeah. So at, right as I got shot, 911 was picking up the phone. So I was on the phone trying to tell them the best where I was at. Um, obviously a little frazzled as to what's going on, uh, trying to give them the best location I could. I kept telling them the street. Um, and which way I was starting the run as someone was walking towards me. So, wow. um, I, you know, hats off to the 911 operator and the, and the police and the local PD was just clearing another big scene that they had. I think they had like a fatal hit and run or something that they were leaving. So it was, it was a chaotic event. Holy shit. Do you remember anything from that point forward? Uh, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, the, the officers showed up, uh, at rate right with the fire department. And I mean, all of a sudden, they're start, the cops were just starting to talk. Hey, all right, let's check. Is it a through and through? Do we need to do a chest seal? And I'm just going to the tech med training, too. I'm like, okay, I know what they're talking about, which was a little scary to me because I knew where my wound was. I knew it wasn't a good spot. Um, and then the fire department got there, and they just scooped me up and ran. Um, everyone kept asking, where's my gun? And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't bring it today. <laughs> so I felt a little foolish. <laughs> you would typically bring this gun on the run, right? Yeah, on my, on my longer run. So I have a, a, in my subdivision, I have a shorter route that's like two or three miles that I don't worry about it. It's my safe place. Longer runs, when I get out into the city and everything that time of the morning, I always had my gun with me. One time you decide not to take it. Yep. Not that it would have helped me, but I think it would have given me a little more comfort after the incident to know that I had something to protect myself. And that was one of the things is I just felt so vulnerable at that point. So they, they ship you, they scoop you up, they start shipping you to the hospital. Did you go right to a trauma center or did you guys have to go to a local hospital first? Yeah, no, no. They took me right to the local trauma center. There's two hospitals uh, in Tacoma, Washington that uh, split trauma duties. Uh, funny enough, it, they actually took me to Tacoma General Hospital where my son is actually an ICU nurse. Holy shit. 
Um, so I go in there. The, the one thing I never expected those once they got me in there as they're wheeling me down the hall, um, all the ER nurses were just lined up on the walls. Why? Which I think it's because I was a police officer and the hospital went into lockdown as soon as they heard I was coming there. Um, but to me, that was a very eerie feeling. I thought, man, is this, is this it for me? Wow. So they were getting ready to work on you. Is that what it was? Or they're just locking the hospital down? Uh, they locked the hospital down. And I, I honestly, as soon as I hit the door and got into the hospital, uh, the trauma doctor was like, he jumped right on the side of the cart. He's looking over my injuries. He's telling me specifically what he's going to be doing. Um, it was just, it was very quick, very fast as to how they did it. Um, they didn't stop in any rooms. I, I, they took me right to surgery to do the x-rays and then start the surgery. Wow. Wow. So what kind of injuries did you sustain? Uh, I lost my appendix, which... I did no too big when I was deal. 11. Don, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they thought I was a little crazy still having it at my age, but uh, I did lose the section of my colon and small intestine where it connects. Wow. wow. Um, and there's a valve in there that controls the flow through that area. So I've lost that as well. So, wow. what, so what do you have to live with now because of losing that? Uh, I'll be on medication the rest of my life. Some uh, They have me on a cholesterol medication right now, which uh, the side effect is binding you up. Okay, that sucks. Um, Otherwise I'd be on a modium 80 all the, you know, all the time. So are you watching now more of what your diet is? Um, I try to, yeah, I, it's, I'm still experimenting with what foods, uh, trigger things for me. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been a, 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 quite an adventure in this whole thing. And, and I'm fortunate, um, the trauma team there, uh, the nurses, uh, I think without that team, I think everything fell in the line, even though it was a crappy situation, no pun intended, but, um, <laughs> if I didn't, if I didn't have those, that trauma team there, um, I very well could be sitting here with a colostomy bag now. Um, because that was, you know, if things didn't go right during that surgery, that was the other option for me. So, uh, I think I, I'm fairly fortunate for how things ended up. What kind of round were you shot with? It was a 40. Okay. And so now you go to the hospital, they put you under, you go through the surgery, you come back out. What goes on from there? Oh, man, I just remember waking up that night uh, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, first thing I remember is they were demanding I had to do a COVID test. Oh, that's um, ridiculous. How absurd. <laughs> you know, you're the first person that said that, too. And my, my wife was laughing because I, was, I wasn't very kind to the nurse, and the nurse was great because um, I was still coming out of the anesthesia. And, and my wife, just kept, I just kept hearing her say, don't listen to him. Just do it. Get it done so it's over with. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, so we had a guy who did the podcast a couple weeks ago, and they brought him in. He shot and like, we're going to give you the COVID-19 vaccine. He's like, no, you're fucking not. <laughs> yeah, you know? I heard that one. Yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't force it on me. I already had it, though. So um, but they gave me the COVID test. And it was just at that point, uh, my wife tell me little, little bits and pieces of what actually happened during the surgery. Um, I didn't know the full extent of the surgery, probably until a week and a half after the surgery. They kind of kept some of it from me. Um, but I, I tell you what my wife said, I, I don't know who you think you are, but this has gone nationwide and I have no idea why. <laughs> I mean, did you see the light bulb go off in my head when, when you said that? I know exactly mm -hmm. what it was. I remember seeing this. It required, you know, and look, let's face facts. There's a lot of traumatic things that go on. This one I remember specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just triggered all those, I'd be reading, you know. Yeah, a lot of people say that, and I still to this day I don't know why it got so much attention. Um, I, I ha some of it has to do with my position with uh, the law enforcement torture in the Special Olympics, but um, I, it's just cr it's a crazy story, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so, what kind of rehab have you had to go through? I mean, are were you living with any kind of pain and and, and the comfort, you know, discomfort with the, with the the injury you sustained? Yeah, I mean, uh, I. Pain. Uh, the funny thing is, is if I ever sneeze real hard, uh, the where the bullet went in hurts. Wow. Um, I have about a foot scar on my stomach where they went in to do the surgery. So wow. obviously I'm dealing with that on um, the, you know, how the scar still kind of hurts and that. So uh, other than that, it's it's really been more of the, the PTSD. And what I mean, you can share what you want to share. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you're experiencing? Oh, I, you know, I'm very open about this. Uh, for me right now, uh, today, 
uh, this morning before the podcast, I went on a run. Uh, it's only been the third time that I've run alone since the incident. Okay. Um, I still have a lot of anxiety just running and I only stay in my neighborhood. Uh, just any type of uh, loud, loud noise or anything still will trigger me um, if I'm not expecting it. What happens? Uh, just uh, it's, just, it's, it's just that, yeah, it's that jump. And then, you know, your, your heart rate just goes up real quick because you, you know, all of a sudden you're back in that incident. Um, I, the other week, uh, the other week, right. It was just this past week. And, um, there's a small grocery store up by my vacation property. They had a fought with a shoplifter and stuff. And I got there just a couple minutes after, and I hear them talking about the story and man, my anxiety just went up because what would I have done? I'm off duty. I've got a gun. What, what, you know, how would have I interacted? And I just, it threw me off over the edge. So I'm um, just trying to get back down. So it's just that little stuff that no one ever thinks about, um, that, that keeps coming back. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm working hard. Um, my hats off to my wife because she's been, uh, she's been a rock for me. Uh, it, she had me to a therapist. Uh, I was home within a week from the hospital and within probably three to four days, she had me in a therapist's office already. Um, talking about the incident. She said, you're very, not going to sit good. here. Yeah. She's like, she, she wouldn't let me sit there and suffer. Um, she pretty much, I mean, I say she's hit all the alcohol in the house. She hasn't really, but she's, she's pretty adamant that, you know, no, you're not going to, you're not going to hit the bottle or anything like that. Not that I've ever been a big drinker, but I mean, she's just very cautious about it. And like I said, she's just been a rock for me. Has your therapy been helping you? It has been, um, you know, I started off with a therapist that, uh, is not approved uh, under our workers' comp uh, for uh, the state, so I've had to change to a new one uh, and just starting to you know restart through. And, and the big thing, and I know a couple of your past guests have talked about it. Uh, you have to make sure you get a fit with your with your therapist um, and make sure that they understand what works for you. Because my my new one started off telling me I get, I need to imagine this picture, I need to do this in my mind, mm -hmm. picture, all these pictures. I don't think that way. And finally, I just a timeout. I don't know if we're a fit because I can't think with pictures in my head. I need more logical stuff. And we've now changed courses and it seems to be doing a lot better. So that's great. <clears throat> Anything that you're doing proactively outside of seeing a therapist, like have you thought about meditation at all? Um, part of my therapy is uh, the, the breathing and all that, which is the meditation. Um, the problem for me is if I have a lot of quiet time, um, my mind races back to that incident yet. Okay. I understand. So, I mean, it was probably a month before my TV was ever turned off in this house at night when I, when we were going to bed, I had to have the TV on all the time in case I woke up or that kind of stuff. So I'm sorry that you're going through that. You know, I, I am. And this, this sheds light on the severity of these circumstances and situations. And not to say this is any more important than anybody else's significant post-traumatic stress uh that they're dealing with and, and these traumatic incidents and it's good to be a part of a conversation moving forward now where we're actually having open table discussions because you're sharing this with everybody else they might be saying to themselves all right this is normal right i am the human brain is an interesting organ and people are really discounting how significant it can be and detrimental it could be to progress. You might want to do something, but your body might be saying something completely different. You know, I'm a very calm person and I've managed to learn how to corral my brain where I can control it in a sense of like my meditation. I, I do meditation practice every day. Even when I fly, which was a very, very difficult thing for me to do, even now, and I enjoy flying like tremendously, I'll still have moments where I'm like, my mind starts to go. I'm um, like, I bet you the people who were flying on the flights that went down never thought that they were going to go down just like this flight didn't know it was going to go down. You know, and I'm like, you know, and then I'm just like, I go back to this sense, like it's a commercial airline. You know what I mean? You have a one in 11 million chance of this being you. They fly thousands of these every day. Uh, for the past 20 years, it hasn't been an incident. The likelihood of this happening to you, more of a chance you know, and that's, uh, that's where I go back to my comp state. And then I'm also like, well, fuck it. What am I going to do if it does, right? I'm, I'm in that one as well. I'm like, at least I have good life insurance for my wife and kids. So, um, but the mind's interesting, man. And I'm in, I'm in a lot of control of my mind. I've spent a lot of time 
developing these skills through education practices. I try to take my health very seriously. The point I'm making is even I still go through that shit. You know, so it, and I think I, I think I'm really, really fortunate to have been blessed with the, the, the DNA, which I'm sure you did at some point, too. So just to show the vulnerability of of everybody and the brain, it's a it's a you know, I mean, there's some things that I'm just thankful throughout my career that I did not have to take part in or see. Yeah, it's yeah. fucked up stuff. It is. And, and I got to say that this was a, a learning opportunity for my department and I think other departments as well. Um, having an officer involved in something like this off duty, because it doesn't happen. I mean, a lot. And, uh, you know, my department made a couple of mistakes uh, with me that, you know, we've discussed and I don't hold any grudges. But um, very first thing that I heard, uh, it was a my very first day after the uh, incident happened. Uh, some some people from work were sending me text messages. Hey, I can't believe they already gave your desks to someone else. And wow. um, and they had uh because I was a recruiting guy and the and the background guy, and they had to get moving on it, but they just had someone go to my desk, clean it all off, and basically start new. So in my head, I'm thinking, am, am I coming back from this? Wow. Uh, the other thing was too is when I called them and said, "Hey, I'm ready to start coming back to work. I've got you know clearance from the doctor. Do I need to go in for a psyche eval?" And they're like, "Nope, you didn't shoot a gun. You're good. Come on in." And to me, I was like, and, and my wife was like, "You've you've had your psyche eval already. You're seeing a therapist. I I trust that you're okay." Um, but to me, it was just like, well, you know, you just got shot. What's the big deal? Um, and uh, we had some long discussions on that. And, and you know, they, they, they have apologized. They said, you know, we did mess up on those things. And, and you know, we've, we've learned from them. All these things that we're sharing are good because there are people who are administrators and future administrators listening to this. And I think one great thing that's coming out of our organization is understanding how to empathize and compassion. Some of these ingredients that I think have been missing in law enforcement for a while that we're really harping and pushing on the forefront of what's a major ingredient in the formula of good police work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you taking the time to share this really, really promotes that. Yeah. And that that's, I think, the important thing is just getting out there, making sure that everyone knows that, man, this stuff is OK to talk about. Uh, there's we've been in this. I mean, I've been in this career like 27 years. And I remember when we first started, man, it you wouldn't talk about anything about anything that bothered you in, in law enforcement, you just stuff it down and, and let it just fester. So I think it's important for us to have these conversations. I don't know if we can't not have these conversations at this point. You know what I mean? I think yep. they just have to occur. They have to happen. But yeah. Um, how is your, how's your family been with everything? Um, really good. I mean, it was, it was really good being at my son's hospital because uh, they weren't going to allow visitors because of COVID. Um, and he was able to, you know, come up and see me, uh, and get my wife access up to, to be with me as well. Uh, so it was, it, that was good. Um, and my daughter's in Wisconsin, so she flew out as soon as she could. So they've been, they've been handling it really well. Um, you know, they, they know that it's just something that I got to deal with and I'll keep moving forward. Now my wife is ready for me to retire. <laughs> I was hoping for another couple of years and, uh, she keeps pushing me to, you know, hang it up here uh, pretty quick by the end of the year. So we'll see. I guess there's a little give and take, right? I mean, she's been great for you and maybe, maybe it's a, it's a nice gift to her if you don't need the money and maybe transitioning to something else, you know, something right. that's uh, just as fulfilling and we're going to be doing stuff. So I'm glad that we've connected and might be able to use a guy like you, even if it's something that we can't compensate for up front. If you, if mm -hmm. a lot of people who are in that group are finding a lot of comfort helping other people who've been through this. Right. I don't know if you agree with that, but we don't look to capitalize. We just need to set the system where we can make sure people are getting the support that they need. And that's kind of the, I think it starts to feel like a big part of everybody's why of why did this happen to me? What should I do now? What's my purpose? And maybe your purpose is being there to support others. That, and that's what I'm hoping. I mean, I want to be able to help anyone I can. Um, and again, that's why I reached out right away when you guys said you were looking for people. Um, right, I mean, I got to, like I said, it's a weird story. It wasn't a huge gun battle. I mean, it's not the, it's not anything that any cop ever dreams of going through. You were this still incident. being a cop, Donovan, you know? <laughs> right. And, you and you were still thing. a fucking cop. Yeah, I know. And it took me a while to actually understand that because, you know, uh, local media was doing interviews and they called me a hero. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I stopped a couple of guys from getting into a, a business, you know, um, and that that's it. But 
I was doing, now I've, I've come to realize, yeah, I was doing, I was doing cop work. <laughs> Did they find these people? Um, there's still, the investigation's still going on. Um, I get the limited uh, information just because they want to, you know, keep me, you know, um, good for if I ever have to testify. Uh, they are working some leads. Uh, it sounds like there are some people who are uh, willing to talk about who actually did it. Um, this is, it's part of a group that's been running pretty heavy in our area on burglaries and stealing vehicles and stuff. So they, they have their suspects and I think they're narrowing it down. Man, I hope you find some comfort when they, uh, when that starts to get closed up a little bit. I think I will. I mean, and, and to me, I've already kind of, I've kind of just accepted that if they catch them, they catch them. If they don't, they don't. I'm here now. Um, yeah, you know, second least on life, right? Yep. I, I won. I won on that one. And I just know uh, comfort wise that the life they live, uh, I'll probably outlive them yet. So good for you, man. Let me ask you this. What is the one thing that you took away from this incident? And probably leading towards the good thing that you just want to pass along to other, whether it's uh, others, whether it's a tactical piece of advice or um, a piece of life advice, just give us one good thing. Cause I know you've gone through a lot of series of emotions and a lot of thoughts and pondering and hypothesizing. So I'm just curious, what is that thing that you'd want to share? You know, the one thing is, is that even when cops are being beat down in the media day in and day out, uh, we have a great group of supporters out there who do support us. The amount of support I got through this whole incident from the community and, and literally from across the country was phenomenal. Um, and, and, and it came at a time when I was ready to give up thinking, you know, that, hey, you know, no one likes law enforcement. Why, why am I even in this job? Um, and, and you get that little boost there um, that, you know, people are out there. They are supporting us. And it really is when they say the silent majority, it, it pains me to say it, but it is a silent majority, but they're out there. Mm. Hear that over and over again. And I think it really reveals and pulls back the curtain on the truth. Mm -hmm. It does. It really does. The media is very interesting and they're, they're, you know, I, I'm not going to get into, you know, all these conspiracy theories, but I've been subjected to it. I know it exists. I know it's real. And I know that they are in control of the perception of the country and they will make it look however they want to make it look. Right. No matter what, that is the game. I'm not making yeah. excuses for anybody. I'm saying they will make it look however they want to make it look. They want you to make it look like a hero. They can do a good job of that. They want to make you look like a villain. They can do that too. Editing is a very powerful tool. Yes. So the only thing you can counter against editing like that is standing your, your ground very firmly and not pandering. And we see that that is a very good solution and counterattacking, right? Counterattacking in a sense of, you say this, we say that. Here's a typical example. We've decided to release the body camera video immediately. We know this person was shot. I'm, unfortunately for their family, the media is doing this to us. Here's what really happened. And yep. all of a sudden it all starts to, the truth comes out. The truth shall set you free and it really, they are trying to cover the truth as much as they possibly can. Yes, they are. And it's real. And I know it's real. I'm not saying that because I'm a nut. I'm saying it because I've experienced it. And I have yep. the, the, the videos, the articles written about me to prove it. But I keep my eyes focused forward on what's important for us to do as a community and actually for the world, man. It's guys like you that are doing great things for the world. You don't know the impact that you've had over 27 years and even taking this last 45 minutes of your time to tell your story is a great deed to the world. And you're doing great service for your brothers and sisters in blue and believe that that's really true. Well, thanks. I, I really appreciate it. I think it's important that we have these conversations, man. It's a pleasure meeting you. This will certainly not be the last time we get together face to face. And um, I'm sure that you're going to see more opportunity coming up to help others in the future as we continue to iron things out here. And then I can start having those, other discussions, well, this, as long as this machine's working correctly, it's hard to do everything at once. And I say this over and over again, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. I can't come in here and try to do the whole thing in one day. It's, it's not easy. So I have to, this is a top priority for me. There's a lot of stuff going on in the background that I can't announce publicly yet, but you can see we're moving forward with having more discussion with our in-house psychotherapists 
to try to offer advice to the masses, little by little, day by day, brick by brick, we are building the house. So it's going to be exciting to see what comes out. A real pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Donovan. Take care, my friend. All right.